is if you're going to get a black opal with lots of colour, you're not going to pay 20 or 30, 30 or 50 dollars for it. That's just the way it is because there's so much which goes involved in defining opal. Um, it's a very infinite resource. It takes a lot of money, determination. It's, so we decided that we could even maybe even open up a new market for the potch opal for our miners. Yep and for our opal coins as well. Would you do it again? Look, we've talked about doing it again. It was probably, you know, when you start off with a harebrained idea on the edge of a drill in the middle of the day going, yeah, we can do this, and then you get into the whole back end of it. There was a lot of work. Like, to be realistic, the amount of time and everything, you know, these guys were wonderful and they supported us because all the money that we raised went to the local hospital. Yeah, right. So for the 30 or $50 pieces, 30 was a small piece and 50 was a large piece, there was probably about 200 hours of work. Lauren's saying, no, I'll put that number up. There was a lot of work which went into it because there was also the editing side of things and, um, you know, Kel's really good at editing and, and, you know, social media, so I sort of took over more of the get the pieces cut, get them sorted and, you know, delegate those jobs yep. and then, you know, Kel had a lot of work to do as far as editing and making sure things got up on time and all this sort of stuff, made sure that everyone was happy with their videos yeah. and, you know, that they got their story and their point across too, so I don't even, I don't think we could say how many hours at all. To... We've been on the road you know for a little while now and we've heard lots of people are coming to Lightning Ridge and they're very excited about it have you seen people come because of this campaign look I don't know if they've actually just come for this campaign I'm sure we put it under the noses of people but the town has been absolutely chockers with people it's been really great to see that people will come out of you know Sydney or, you know and come out and see their own backyard um, and it was funny, a lot of people said, oh, you know, with Opal Hunters, like, until then, a lot of people didn't realise that we actually existed and that we're small individual companies, we're small individual miners. Anyone can come out here and have a crack at it. Yeah. Um, you know, it's one of the last places, and I remember the producer of Opal Hunters who said to me, he said, it's like one of the last Wild West where anyone can come out and have a crack and try their luck. And if they find Opal, well, then, you know, that's a huge... Thing for them and then you know they become hooked and some people only need one day underground and they become hooked one hour underground, one hour underground. <laughs> but it comes back to that thing I think that a lot of humans and, and all of us have inside of us is that there's something really cool about finding something yeah. I don't care if you're digging around the back of your lounge and you find a two dollar coin you're like Woohoo! cheering scored but even just picking up something shiny or pretty or shells there's there's something very childlike about it when people ask what's my favorite opal it's like asking what's my favorite child i don't like giving them away i don't like selling them but we have to turn them over that is the incredible Lightning Ridge opal miner, Kelly Tischler, and also her co-founder of Outback Opal Queens, Lauren Gloria, as well, speaking with me at the Lightning Ridge Opal Miners Christmas Party. I lucked an invitation to chat with those two incredible women. If you want to learn more about what the Outback Opal Queens have done this year, uh, share some of their stories as well. Hear from Kelly, who talks a lot about what it's like to be an opal miner in Lightning Ridge, third generation opal miner right here in in New South Wales. You can find them on social media. Just search Outback Opal Queens or you can head online to outbackopalqueens.com. You're listening to ABC Radio. 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 On your Monday evening, you're with Kaya Hanley across ABC Radio, Sydney, Canberra and New South Wales. We're going to talk Christmas carols yet, uh, next. There is a team of two bringing the evening's program to you for the next couple of weeks. That would be me, Kaya Hanley, and uh, the person you might talk to on the other side of the phones is Kyle Carroll. One of us likes Christmas. The other one is a bit of a Grinch. So we're going to try to convince each other that Christmas is an exciting time of year through the power of music by delving into some of your favourite Christmas carols and pulling up some fun facts, some interesting versions, some things you maybe never knew about the Christmas carol that you are enjoying singing to when you're in the supermarket at the moment. We'll do that next. Up to Cass Houghton with Typical Bride. Just 
Hails from the Blue Mountains. It is country singer-songwriter Cass Hopeton with Typical Bride. It's a single. It was produced by Aria and Golden Guitar Award-winning producer Matt Fell. The ABC Grandstand website is live. A one-stop shop for all your sporting needs from across the country. NRL, AFL, AFLW, rugby, cricket, netball, golf, NBL, tennis, all your sporting codes. Go in-depth analysis, interviews and coverage of your favourite sports from players, coaches and experts. Caught in the air, caught it short mid-wicket. Flip in play. Ball. Go to abc.net.au slash grandstand. You are with Kaya Hanley on ABC Radio Sydney, Canberra and New South Wales evenings. We're about eight minutes away from 10 o'clock. You'll hear what's coming up on Nightlife very, very soon. But it's T minus 11 days. Do we ca- Almost 10 I'd say at this point of the night until the big day. So it would only be fitting to get into the festive spirit and learn a little bit about the carols that you sing each and every year. While they do seem to start popping up earlier and earlier in supermarkets and shopping centres, let's officially start our countdown to Christmas here on Evenings. And there's only one person who can do that. Since the start of December, he's dubbed himself Kyle Christmas Carol. So each day at this time, he's going to take you behind the scenes, get a little bit of a fun fact for some of your favourite carols of the season. It was the nights before Christmas and the radio was on. Kyle Carroll was ready to share his daily Christmas song. This is Kyle Christmas Carol's Carol of the Day. I'm so excited to be getting into the festive spirit with this segment and with the last name Carol, well, it'd be rude not to have a love for Christmas. So I thought we could start with the song that commences the festive season. When Meredith Wilson wrote it back in 1951, it was originally called It's Beginning to Look Like Christmas. Since then, it's come under a different name with a lot thrown in the middle there. It's been covered by a number of artists, most famously by this fella in 2011. It's beginning to look a lot like 
Christmas everywhere you go. But he wasn't the first. With Bing Crosby recording a cover the year it was released. Actually, only a few short months after the original. Candy canes and silver lanes aglow. It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. Toys in every store. And then most recently, the famous Megan Trainer has taken it on in her Christmas album this year, A Very Trainer Christmas. But it'd be rude not to give the credit to the original, written by Meredith Wilson and performed by Perry Como, the Fontaine sisters, Mitchell Ayers and his orchestra on September 18, 1951. Interestingly, a popular belief in Yarmouth, Nova Scotia, a port town in Canada, is that he wrote the song while staying there in the Grand Hotel. The song makes reference to a tree in the Grand Hotel, one in the park as well. The park being Frost Park, directly across from the Grand Hotel, which still operates in a newer building on the same site as the old one. It also makes mention of a 5 and 10, which was a store operating in Yarmouth at the time. Without further ado, the originally titled, It's Beginning to Look a Lot Like Christmas. It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas Everywhere you go Take a look in the five and ten Listening once again With candy canes and silver lanes aglow It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas Toys in every store But the prettiest sight to see Is the holly that will be On your own front door A pair of hop along boots And a pistol that chooses The wish of Barney and Ben Dolls that'll talk and we'll go for a walk Is the hope for Janice and Jen And Mom and Dad can hardly wait For school to start again Beginning to look a lot like Christmas Everywhere you go Now there's a tree in the Grand Hotel One in the park as well The sturdy kind that doesn't mind the snow It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas <laughs> Soon the bells will start and the thing that will make them ring is, is the carol that you sing right within your heart. A pair of hop along boots and a pistol that shoots is the wish of Barney and Ben. Dolls that'll talk and we'll go for a walk Is the hope for Janice and Jen And the mom and dad can hardly wait For school to start again <laughs> It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas Soon the bells will start And the thing that will make them ring Is the carol that you sing right within Perry Como and the Fontaine sisters with Mitchell Ayers and his orchestra with its beginning to look a lot like Christmas. Kyle, Christmas Carol will be back to share his Carol of the Day and his festive vibe with you same time tomorrow on Evenings. You're listening to Evenings on ABC Radio. You are with Kaya Hanley on ABC Radio Sydney, Canberra and New South Wales, but it's nearly time me to say goodbye and hand over to Suzanne Hill and the Nightlife team who drops by now to tell you what you can expect. Good evening. Hi, Kaya. So were you converted? Is the whole idea of that singing made to make you feel all cheery and Christmassy? I mean, I think so. All I could think of was TikTok <laughs> because there is a viral dance to that song at the moment and now I feel like I should learn it. Right. I quite enjoyed that. Yeah. I think carols are the best of Christmas. Do you? I think that's probably my favourite part. Even when they start in good. September? <laughs> No, that's a little too early. I know there's always that moment when you're in the supermarket and you hear it and you're like, it's mid-November, people. What are you doing? It piles the pressure on, doesn't it? It, it, it absolutely does. So I am I'm feeling it more. By next week, I'll, I'll be in Festivus, I promise. 
Well, let's see what, what work Carl can do with you. <laughs> what are you talking about coming up? Uh, we're actually talking about saying sorry. So we've got our regular guest clinical psychologist, Dr. Sarah Edelman, uh, who will be with us. And we're going to take this, this one on. It's a big one. Some of us find it not that challenging to say sorry. Whereas for other people, squeezing out a sorry can be one of the hardest things that you can say. Um, then there's the question about how we feel when someone says sorry to us. So what's a genuine apology if someone apologises? Are you obliged to accept it? And why are apologies so important? So we're going to open up that can of worms in our first hour tonight. Kaya. Big topic. Can't wait. Suzanne, thank you. Thanks, Kaya. Suzanne Hill and your Nightlife team coming your way next here on ABC Radio. Thanks for your company today. I'll see you tomorrow. Keep up to date with ABC Radio. Tweet us on Twitter. Like us on Facebook. And follow us on Instagram. Catch the latest from ABC Radio. Anywhere, anytime. ABC News with Glenn Lauder. Fire crews will remain at the scene of a blaze in Melbourne's west, which has left one man with burns and a number of buildings destroyed. It took crews about three hours to control the blaze around Mount Cottrell, Truganina and Chartwell. Paul Elso from the Country Fire Authority says it's caused some damage, but it could have been worse. Yeah, we're pleased with the outcome of the fire this afternoon. Some damage has been caused to, uh, I think, uh, at current count, four outbuildings, um, generally small sheds and about eight cars that are in a a storage sort of scenario in one of the paddocks. Public submissions have opened as part of a review into the bushfire on Queensland's Fraser Island. The blaze, which started in mid-October, blackened more than half of the World Heritage listed site. It's now been contained and visitors will be allowed back from tomorrow. Emergency Management Inspector General Alistair Dawson says the review, ordered by the Premier, will look at preparedness and also the response to the fire. Anything that the community feels that we should know about, that they would like us to know about, that they would like to tell us, anything in regards to that, we would be very grateful for them uh, sending uh, information to us. The tourism industry has welcomed news that Trans-Tasman Travel Bubble is likely to be in place early next year. New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern has announced her government's agreed in principle to set a date for reopening to Australia sometime in the new year. Chief Executive of New Zealand's tourism industry, Chris Roberts, hopes to see the arrangement in place by the end of summer. We would have liked it to have been there before Christmas because there's certainly families on both sides of the Tasman that would like to get together for the Christmas period, but we'll survive the summer holiday uh, with just New Zealanders and then uh, from our point of view, if we could have the Australians coming in in February, uh, that would be fantastic. Christmas bargain hunters are being warned to watch out for bogus deals being offered by scammers. Authorities say there's been a 42% jump of fraud reported this Christmas compared to the same time last year, with 12,000 people reporting losses of $7 million so far. Natalie Faulkner from KPMG says the scammers are capitalising on the boom in online shopping during COVID-19. There's been a rise in high demand goods such as computers, phones, puppies, shoes and popular toys. And so what the fraudsters are doing is setting up fake...